Welcome everyone, and thanks for making the time to join us for today's webinar. We're gonna be discussing maximizing the potential of your small business. Our special guests today were to be Scott Marsh, owner of the Lucky Charm Rockingham in WA, and who's also our acting chairman of Auna, and Damien D'Agostino from Wangaratta Lotto Card and Tobacconist in Victoria. Unfortunately, as many of you uh, experience on a day-to-day -day basis, Damien's had two staff call in sick today, so regrettably he hasn't been able to join us as a result, so we'll hope to have Damien join us again in another opportunity. Um, but Scott is uh, happily flying solo with us today um, for our discussion, so we've got half an hour. If you have any questions for Scott during the webinar, please put them in the Q&A section um, that you'll see a button for below, and we'll try to answer those um, as we can at the end of the webinar. So welcome, Scott, um, and thank you for your valuable time and also appreciate you being willing to uh, to do this on your own today. Yes. Um, it's uh, often the way in news agents, uh, you, you don't know what to expect every day when you get up, um, what's going to happen in the store, and uh, Damien's situation is just a classic example of that. So. Um, now, look, Scott, you've been working in the industry, news agent industry um, off and on for quite a long time, but I know you've also had a career in the corporate world. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your journey um, and how you came to be in the industry? Uh, yeah, so uh, I uh, studied economics and finance at university, got into broking, um, into the insurance industry for a while, um, had the executive role for a mutual insurer in Sydney for a few, quite a few years, and then was the um, general manager of sales and marketing at RAC in Western Australia, um, and did that for five years. And then decided after about 20 or so years, my dad had a business, the Lucky Charm Rockingham. He wanted to retire. So I went in as part owner with him to do something different. And uh, yeah, since then, um, We've uh, we purchased another store which we've sold, the Lucky Charm Waikiki, and I'm also about 18 months into another store which I own, which my wife has now joined me in, um, which is the Lucky Charm in Victoria Park. So we still have two stores now. Um, yeah, it's been interesting. It's been around 11 years, I think, in the news agency business. Yeah, wow. Well, okay. Um, and do you, you, you're obviously still loving it. Um, ha having your wife in the business is, um, is a, yeah, I suppose, uh, having that extra support is really important. Um, and I know the businesses, you know, seem to be doing well. And we'll, you know, get into the details of that as we go through um, some of the questions. Um, probably where I might start before I get into sort of talking about how you maximise the potential of your small businesses what is, what are the key issues? What are you seeing in your businesses day to day right now? I suppose it's really a question about the economy. Um, you know, is there anything really standing out for you? Well, consumer spends down, um, and it's really started to hit. I mean, as interest rates and inflation take effect, uh, interest rates is a lagged effect um, when they go up. A lot of people on fixed mortgages and those types of things, or they have spare savings, and there certainly was a lot of saving and consumer savings that occurred during COVID. Um, that is slowly starting to take a hit. Um, and we're starting to see that, particularly the last couple of months with the effect of discretionary spend, giftware and those types of items. Haven't really seen much of a hit in Lotto, which has been good, um, although it's largely jackpot dependent, so it's sort of hard to track that one. Um, the other thing, we've had wage costs go up another, what, close to 4% recently. Mm. Um, workers' compensation insurance has gone up a lot in, in WA. I'm not sure of the rest of the country. Uh, so, and then there's continued pressure from leasing. I think a lot of the leasing agents have seen a few good years. Um, uh, they certainly consolidated a lot of the, the cost of leasing during COVID. And I think they're trying to recover a bit of that now. And, uh, um, you know, I've got some challenges with some of our leasing agents at the moment that we're working through. So, you know, I, I think there's gonna be a, a few, at least another six or so months where things are gonna be a little bit tougher than they have been. Um, probably, um, but I don't think it's going to drop too much below the 2019 level, which was before COVID hit. Yep. Yeah, so there's some of our challenges. But luckily, I don't have staff issues um, in terms of getting staff, um, like, but that's I know good. a lot of stores do, particularly in regional areas. Yeah, and look, that's sort of broadly what I'm hearing. Um, I mean, I have um, been hearing things about some of the bigger landlords uh, expecting to put leases up considerably, and that's a real worry. Um, we are also hearing of business pack insurance going up quite a bit um, across the country. So there's those costs. I guess the flip side of that, I mean, we had a pretty good run with Lotto early in the year, which obviously was very, very helpful. And I think until we see some 
some you know uh, change to the settings around interest rates and whether that'll be this year or next year remain to be seen um, it's going to be difficult for consumers to feel that level of confidence that things are getting better rather than you know whether it's the status quo or getting worse um, probably the only thing I think is probably interesting is um, is the tax cuts I think we might see a little bit of discretionary spend come out of those tax cuts because they're fairly substantial um, but yeah, it's, uh, in, it, I think you're right. I think the next six months is going to be um, key and getting through that as successfully as we can. And hence, uh, around the conversation today was just to talk about, you know, what are some of the things that members can do in their businesses, uh, some of the insights um, that might be useful in, in just navigating that, that next uh, six months. And um, the next question I had was around sort of core categories and how they're performing. Um, and then also where you're looking to grow in your business. Um, is it in existing categories or new categories that you're looking to introduce into the business or is it a bit of both? And do you have any tips for members on, on how you're managing these and how they can do it better? Well, the lottery commission increases that Eleanor have helped um, deliver over the last few years um, across the country have certainly been helpful in Lotto. I think Lotto is one of those things you've just got to deliver good service, run the process, follow the guidelines set by um, your lottery supplier and, and, and try and leverage as much as you can out of that. Um, for us, uh, uh, we're really working to grow our giftware categories. Um, so um, we have now the purchase of the Lucky Charm Vic Park we have turned what was about 120,000 in gifts um, in excess of 250,000 in the first wow. year. And we're still achieving growth in that store. So our focus is really to try and grow that category and, and with it, cards tend to be elevated as well. So I think when the environment's slowing down, people tend to pull back on their purchasing. I um, mean, you do need to be smart with it, but you've got to make sure you've got your shelves full, clean and well presented. Um, um, because, you know, an average set of shelves, say you've got three 1.2 metre glass shelves, um, so let's say you're paying $1,000 per square metre in rent, um, you consider all the the, the, the the space inside the stores where people can come in and walk around and all that sort of thing, you're probably paying $3,000 a year for those three shelves. So you've yep. got to make sure they're full. And when customers are being a little bit um, more careful with their spend, when they do come into your short store, you want to make sure there's something there for them. So, mm. so you've got to make sure those shelves are full um, and um, you've got to make sure you've got the right people looking after them as well. So I still think you should take some risks on products and try to grow the categories that you're trying to grow. Um, another one with us is stationery, um, particularly in our Rockingham store, largely because it's a larger store and we do do three schools for back to school there. Um, right is we're just trying to continually evolve that category, move away from the traditional stationary lines. They're still important to have, um, and they're still important to be priced competitively, um, particularly with what your Kmart or your um, your Woolworths or Coles sells in your shopping centre area, and also with office works to make sure you've got that, that competitiveness, but move more towards some of the gifting lines, journals and those types of things. So we've been pretty successful at that in Rockingham. We're still trying to navigate that space and improve in that area. Yep. And are there any other um, sort of new categories that you've brought into the stores in the last few years that have worked well for you? Or is it more um, around well, new, new products? It's really around the giftware side of things that we've really grown our stores in. Rockingham has been like that for three or four years since we did the last refit and totally transformed the store from a traditional tobacco, which we don't do at all anymore, card, um, stationery and lotto, magazines. Um, yep. So we use our technology, we use POS solutions and under our giftware category, we have segmented um all of our subsections under giftware. So we'll have a category for candles and soaps and fragrances, um, and then we'll have subcategories under that. We'll have a category under homewares, which can be quite broad, depending on how you want to, to, to do that. A category under baby and wedding, a category under um, jewelry and those types of things. Uh, women's fashion, we have a separate category on. So at, at monthly, we have targets for all of those categories. Um, okay. And then at the end of each month, we run a report to see exactly how much we've sold um, so we're on top of the numbers and then we look at the space allocated to it. So um, our focus is really to 
um, grow those categories, yeah, the subsections under giftware. Technically, it's not giftware. You could say it's a gift for yourself. Half of the customers or more that buy gifts from us are buying items for themselves. So it's a personal gift, I guess you could say. Um, yes. So, yeah, so we're really just trying to get on top of those, finding out which ones are working and aren't working. So, for example, I'm in the Vic Park store. We've got this large section at the back of the store, which is all baby products and some plush and et cetera, et cetera. We're finding, you know, it's doing four or $500 a month. It's just not paying its space. Um, yeah. So we need to find a way to either improve that somehow by changing the mix that's in that area um, or divesting in it, reducing the footprint and, and moving in areas that are showing growth. Yeah, that's a really important insight, I think, and it's <clears throat> often not well under understood, I think, across the industry is really being able to map the areas in your store and the cost of all of those areas and making sure that they are paying their way. Um, and I think it's a really critical one that you've got to be using your data to actually understand um, those different metrics. Um, and also, I think it's interesting how you're really breaking down the granularity of that sort of growth area in most, I'd say most of our member businesses, which is that sort of gifting area. And also understanding that um, as we're in a sort of restrained discretionary spending economy, that um, what I would call little luxuries that people are buying for themselves can be really effective because, you know, people, maybe they're not spending a lot of money, but if they're, um, you know, they can't afford to go out for dinner or something, they might just like buying that little, little um, bit of, uh, I suppose, consumer joy that they can get from a news agent. And that's an area where we can really win. Yeah. Well, one thing we do do um, is we're trying to look at um, one thing that's important, I think, for retailers to have a look at is, and to learn a little bit about their business is to go visit other suppliers. So there's a couple of very top end gift stores in Western Australia that myself and my wife go and visit. She prefers to go than I do because she buys stuff and um, <laughs> it's not the greatest way to spend a Saturday for me, but um, we do get to see what they, they're selling. And a lot of these really top end gift stores do a lot of kitchenware. Um, so, you know, not knives and forks, but, you know, bowls mm. and platters and all these types of things. And if you think about in your house, um, the air, the room in your house that has lots of stuff, it's yep. the kitchen. And, a, and it's a room you spend a lot of time in. It's a room you do your entertaining from. So we're really looking to find a way to try and grow that category. We're going to make mistakes on the way. And the other one is also garden. Um, so... Um, the garden, a lot of people love their garden. So springtime, we've last couple of years, we've pushed a real springtime um, promotion thing. right after yep. Father's Day. We try and squeeze it in before we get Christmas out. Yep. Um, there are suppliers like Want, Alfresco Gardens, great. Sometimes the quantities are a bit high, but um, to really try and set up our store um, to look to have a real warm theme. So we bring bales of hay in um, yep. and put the garden rusted spikes in with birds on it and things like that. Yeah, great. Like that. Okay. We've got that in, we've got those ideas because if you go to Gift Fair in Melbourne and you go visit Alfresco Garden and see their display, if you can emulate a little bit of that in your store, um, um, you know, it's gonna work. And and it's and it's and it started to work so well for us in Rockingham. We have a permanent area in the back of our shop outside of Spring that permanently has all this sort of stuff in it. So um yeah. yeah, I think they're great concepts. Um, I mean, my next question was going to be around, you know, what your strategies um, or what strategies you've um, found effective in differentiating your business from competitors and attracting new customers. And I think they're two great examples um, of how you can actually do that and really think about what your customers might want. I mean, I think um, seasons has always been something that news agents have had a real strength in, but... Um, we shouldn't kind of become apathetic about just, you know, Mother's Day and Father's Day and Valentine's Day. I mean, obviously, we've seen people embracing Halloween and um, things like that. But I think, um, you know, thinking more broadly about how we can expand on that, um, that sort of ownership of the seasons is really, really valuable. And gar like gardens are a great one. Um, you know, people coming out of winter, particularly in the southern states, um, you know, they they are thinking about those things. And if we can kind of line that up with gifting and at the same time, it's great. 
Yeah, well, we we have a plan for each store, which was detailed initially, but I'm not as detailed yep. anymore. But if you can imagine um, a planner that has a, a month on a page, we just highlight certain things of the year of what we're going to do and promote, what's going to be on our main display tables or a subsection inside the store. So at the moment, it's winter strategy. What's called winter is coming, but that was a Game of Thrones um, Game of Thrones theme. But um, so at the moment, there's a lot of candles and soaps, scarves, um, um, gloves, those types of things that bring a bit of warmth. Um, yep. And then we'll transition out of the winter approach into Father's Day soon. So, yeah, there's always something you can, can promote in the store. But you've got to have a plan for it and you've got to have a calendar, um, not so just yourself to know what's happening, but so the rest of your staff do as well and you can order in advance and get it and get it organised. Yep. And obviously your staff sort of, you know, um, they're fairly used to that. Um, was that something you've been doing for a long time or um, or is it, you know, something that you did in sort of four or five years ago and it's become part of the culture, if you like, of your um, stores? We started it in Rockingham when we did the refit around, I think it's probably close to five years now, where we transitioned away from the tobacco and all that type of thing. Did yep. a detailed plan. I come from a corporate marketing job, used to big plans, but I don't think you really need to do that. Um, you just need to have tar targets per category and a list of action items to try and achieve them. So, uh, yeah, we have. And uh, taking over... The Vic Park store um, around 18 months ago, some really good staff there. So um, we just really set out a plan of what we wanted and when, um, and it's really taken effect now. So I think it's working in both stores. And I'm not in every store all the time. So um, to have staff know what's coming and also to assign them a responsibility, um, hmm. I think it's useful. And, you know, we have quarterly meetings and in those meetings we go over, over what's coming next, how we did Previously, we do a category review on um, how did Mother's Day go, um, what worked, what didn't work, those types of things. Um, I think the importance of that too is that um, an old HR thing, but if you create something yourself, then you own it. But if you get your staff to create it and be involved in building it, they own it. Um, yeah. And they take ownership when things don't work and take ownership when things do work and feel reward from it. So. Mm. And yeah, yeah totally. I think that's a valuable strategy. Mm. Yep. And um, thinking about your competitors, how do you, um, I mean, thinking about how you differentiate yourself from your competitors and you attract new customers, do you um, do you spend much time sort of looking at competitors' stores and understanding what they're doing? Yeah, we do. I mean, you should walk around where you are and see who's around your store, you know, in our Rockingham store, there's a strand bags across from us. So we really haven't gone into that woman's fashion bag range. I just don't think we can compete with them. Um, yep. The range and that sort of thing. If we can find something that's totally different, yes, maybe. But um, so we do look at the competitors that are around and try and find a point of difference. Um, um, yeah, I think news agents um, need to probably be a bit more optimistic, I feel. What we've got that other stores and gift shops particularly don't have, we have the Lotto product. So a Lotto product is a continual flow of income. Um, it's unique to us and it gives us a fair bit of continual revenue that can allow us, even though we don't have the buying power of some of the bigger stores, that can allow us to be price competitive with a lot of the other giftware items we get in. So if you're looking at some of the giftware shops, they might have 200% markup on certain things. We don't need to do that. So we, we can have a point of difference in the news agency business if we get those other categories right. Mm. And, and if we agree with ourselves that what we've been doing in the past needs to change and we need to be very good at what we're going to do in the future, I think there is that lottery product really gives us an ability to do that. Um, that's unique to our industry. Yeah. And is that how you look at lotteries um, largely as just, you know, um, being the vehicle to then, um, you know, turn those customers into, you know, um, more valuable sales? Well, it, it's a vehicle within itself because it is a good product line to have. Mm. Um, strong brand. It's, it's a strong brand. It's good revenue um, and it's good traffic. I mean, it's 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 low margin, high volume sort of stuff. Um 
uh, which was like in the insurance industry, home and car insurance uh, that I worked in for many years. It's yep. low margin, high volume. So um, it gives you that foot traffic and you want to make that work. You want to give great service and make sure your counters are clean and all that sort of stuff. But if you want to expand your business and get the cream on top, um, you can certainly use that product line to give you a point of difference hmm. in the marketplace um, in terms of traffic flow and a point of difference in terms of revenue that a lot of your competitors don't have. Yep. And um, I know we've sort of talked about um, competitors. Um, what uh, if we look sort of more towards the consumer and their preferences and trends that are, are happening in the marketplace with different product offerings and so on, how do you keep up to date with that? Um, so, um, I don't do it myself <laughs> yep. because, um, whilst I am interested in certain aspects of giftware, particularly homewares style of things, um, I'm not very good. I mean, if you look at your customer base, what 90, take lottery aside, 90% of your sales is probably women, right? Yep. So, um, I don't understand the women that well. Can you cut that part out, Ben? Um, so, um, so at least you're on it. <laughs> oh, right, it's live. Um, so, uh, I certainly get staff to keep on top of those types of things. Um, but some things you should so allocate the right people to the job. Women to do those types of roles, I think, is important. Um, and women are that and and find staff that are interested in some things. So, some staff. Um, might be interested in jewellery, others might be interested in homeware. So try and allocate responsibilities based on the category they're interested in. Um, the other thing, as I said before, is if you want to grow into the giftware category, um, you've got to visit competitors that are really good at what they do. Um, you've got to go to the gift fair, maybe not every year, but at least every second year. And if you're in Melbourne and Sydney, you've got no excuse not to go. Hmm. Um, regional is a little bit more difficult or if you're in WA like us, but... Um, it's really important to go visit and see what the latest trends are because they're the ones that are going to show you what they are. Mm. Um, yeah, so they're the primary things to do. Um, and if you are looking for staff, I know staff are hard to get, but if you can find someone that's worked in a giftware store, I mean, one of the ladies in our store, Sharon, um, has worked at multiple wild stores, okay. um, which a lot of them are closing, the wild giftware um, chain. So, um you know, she'd come in and have heaps of ideas of what worked in their stores and she can apply it into ours. Yep. No, it's fantastic. I think it's always good to talk about that because, like, um, you know, one of the risks, I guess, is assuming that you've got the same taste as your customers. And uh, I, I see it regularly um, that, you know, um, maybe reluctantly some of our members put um, a range of products in that they you know, wouldn't have thought to try and they go gangbusters, you know, it's sort of, um, you know, yeah. it's, sometimes we make all sorts of assumptions about who our customers are. <laughs> and, we make, and them. we make mistakes and we make mistakes. We've, there's things we've got that just haven't worked. So, um, you know. And Rotten, when that happens, what do you do? Well, as I said, if, if you're, so Rockingham is near the coast in Western Australia. So a lot of the coastal Hampton style homewares and product lines go really well, which you get from companies like Coast to Coast or Swing Gifts those types of things. Um, they didn't all work as well in Vic Park, which is more in a city um, mm. suburb, quite close to Perth Central. So um, it's good in that I can move stuff between stores. Um, yep. if they're not, but if they're not moving at, at either store or they've just been there for a while, you've got those three shelves that you've got stuff sitting there that's been sitting there for three, four, five months. You've got to, and you're paying $3,000 more for those three shelves a year you've got to move it on. So you've got a discount at all or below cost and much to the disgust of my staff, you've just got to throw it away. And there are things yep. thrown away. Um, I was at a big supplier of homewares the other day, chatting to the CEO when we were doing a order and uh, even they said like, they'll get items in, almost 20% of it they need to either discard or sell below cost to get rid of because they make mistakes as well. And the same thing is going to happen in your store. Yep, no, terrific. And so now moving on to marketing um, and how you market your stores, um, can you share any examples of, you know, successes you've had or initiatives that you've run that have really helped drive sales and customer engagement? Um, yeah, I think um, for the Rockingham store is, um, I mean, if you're in a large shopping centre, you pay rent for traffic, 
your marketing strategy is high rent, right? So, yep. um, so that's certainly part of it. Um, and but you can't just rest on that. So in the Rockingham store, I went out to local schools and approached them with a proposal, talked about what we could do, um, and actually went out and actively promoted the stationary lines. We, you know, we do hundred grand in stationary in January in Rockingham, so it's it's working pretty well for us to do that. So that's a form of active marketing. Um, we're also I'm also part of the Lucky Charm group, so we have quite a large rewards platform, which is. Um, where we get customer loyalty and loyalty cards where there's discounts and all sorts of things that we apply to those. Uh, so from a group perspective, I think our store has got around 20,000 rewards customers, probably got about 10,000 email addresses. A lot of them are incorrect or they don't give it. So we have a good way to market to them with specific offers around um, certain seasonal activities and that sort of thing. So that's quite a lucky thing you have being in a group. Um, yeah, but not all customers um, or stores can do that. Obviously, if they're not in a group, um, and we use Facebook quite heavily as well um, to promote certain things. So, and that's fairly effective. It is effective and it's cheap. Yeah. Um, so you might boost a, an ad will cost you thirty dollars to boost something for a week. You'll get multiple customers that will come in and say, "I saw your ad," and come in and spend a hundred dollars. You only need one of them to pay for the ad. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So, um, yep. it's, pretty, it's pretty cheap to do. I yep. must admit, it is in our plan to do it more regularly. We don't do it as much as what we should, and that's something I need to push a little bit harder with my staff to make sure they, they do those Facebook updates, but we do do them quite regularly. Perfect. Now, um, getting into the weeds a little bit more, how do you approach inventory management? Um, to I mean, we've sort of talked about having the right products and minimising the risk of overstocking or tying up too much capital. How do you approach that? Um, I think we've sort of covered it a little bit in that uh, we've just got to make sure you've got a lot of a lot of stock in your store. It, yep. Your store needs to be well stocked, and and it's it goes against the grain. But in these quiet times, I think you have to have a lot of stock. You've just got to understand what's moving and not moving. And if it's not moving, you've got to discount it and replace it with something that works. And that's really just using the data out of your point of sale and just being really of of sale. Yeah. I mean, if you've yeah. got a bigger store or you're in a group, you might be able to get some bulk buying discounts, uh, which we certainly can do. Um, but you just got to make sure things in your store, you've got to understand how they're performing and move them on if they're not performing. Yep. And if they are performing, don't let yourself run out of stock. You know, I don't. I came into uh, Rockingham yesterday, and um, we sell Main Beach hand creams and all that sort of stuff, and they do a range of products which are quite good. And uh, and uh, you know, there was a couple of the main items missing, and I said to my staff, you know, you've got to make sure these high selling items we don't run out of. You've got to keep the stock coming in. Um, yeah, you've got to keep it full, and and don't be scared to quit stock. And now. Moving on to sort of the work culture, you've talked a bit about giving staff ownership over um, different um, categories or subcategories, which I think is really good. How do you motivate your staff to be great at customer service, especially in you know what's slightly more challenging times? Uh, how do I motivate them? I, I think importantly, as I said before, if you give staff the creation of, to be involved in the creation of a plan and the ownership of a category, they'll want to see that category succeed by themselves. So that'll give them some, you know, internal motivation to make it work. Um, we try to where possible um, and, you know, big jackpot days and that can be difficult, but always have someone walking the floor and helping customers. So always try to have a floor person that's just available all the time, particularly on weekends and Thursdays, which are, are busier sort of times. Mm. Um and um, yeah, and at the end of the month, you know, provide staff with an update on how the categories are performing. So we, at the end of each month, we print out the previous month of the previous year versus this month and all our categories, how we performed. Um, and I highlight things that went well. And I also let people know where things haven't performed and what we can do to try and improve it. So it's just giving that feedback. I think, you know, people like to see progress and like to see effort they're putting in generates a result so i think it's important to let people see what that is yep and um would you have any advice for um you know new or struggling retailers on managing cash flow controlling costs you know 
how do you maintain profitability in in this you know tighter retail trading economy? Uh, so one thing you can do, and um, I did this many years ago, but um, you can go through every cost line on your PL. So um, it's I don't want to tell people the obvious, right? Yeah. But um, telephone, how much you're spending on your phone costs. Have you shopped? When was the last time you shopped it around? How much you're spending on your your um, overdraft account or if you have an overdraft or your bank fees? How much you're spending there? What's your FPOS costs? How can you reduce them? Have they looked at the Suncorp option that Elna provides that has least cost routing or is there something else? Um, and to be really on top of your p and I've seen so many people, the landlord will come in and say, well, rents are going up this amount. You've got to really know if you can afford it. And we, made, I made the mistake um, with my dad many years ago with vicinity in that we signed a lease we probably shouldn't have. Um, and it was a time that all leases were going up and they wanted to put ours up another 5% and just keep it rolling through. And it was it really grown too much over a period of time. And we thought, well, they're not bumping it up 20% like some other retailers. And we went, went along with it. And... Um, we ended up several years later um, at the uh, Small Business Development Corporation um, and we went through arbitration because we just said we couldn't afford the rent. Yeah. So that was a big mistake by me, not getting involved in the numbers as much as I should have and really understood what I could and couldn't afford. Um, and... Uh, it went through a few years of pain. We actually got a good result from the Small Business Development Corporation. And I understand there's one of them in every state, Ben. Yeah, every state. Um, Tasmania doesn't have a commissioner per se, but they do have a um, small business champion. So there's facilities like that in every state now. Yeah. Yeah. So be on top of your numbers. Know what you can and can't afford. So particularly with those big expense lines. Um, and um, I mean, wage costs and, and are an issue, but with, you need people. You you. You don't want excess people, but you don't want a situation where it's a Saturday and the store's busy and you've got three people at the counter or four people at the counter and customers walking through the store and they're not being assisted or helped. So you've got to be careful trying to cut your wages too much. Yeah. And um, with sort of managing costs like that, is that something you're doing on an ongoing basis or do you you know, have a calendar and say four times a year or twice a year or once a year? I'm going to have a review of all of our costs. How do you approach that? Um, I don't have a calendar. Um, no, I when I went into Vic Park store, I certainly did it. That was 18 months ago and certainly can relook really yep. at that. Um, and with the Lucky Charm Rockingham, that was quite a few years ago now. So I'm probably due to do another review. Um, but um, I'm constantly around the place. So I sort of know how we're performing in certain things. But... It's not a bad idea to have a calendar or set yourself a one-year calendar and just once a month pick a, a cost line to try and review um, and um, and go from there. But no, I don't have anything like that. But I think I'm, I think I'm pretty well on top of it. Well, that's great. We haven't got any questions in our Q&A, but we have got a comment from Colleen saying, I agree with Scott, bales of hay are marvellous. Great for Tonka style and farming toys. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Thanks, Colin. And just before we finish up, Scott, I mean, you, you sort of touched there on the lesson learned about your um, your lease um, at Rockingham in the past. Yep. Um, are there any other lessons that you've learned on the journey from past challenges or failures um, that have helped shape your current business strategies and your decision-making process? Um, yeah, I think, as I said before, um, Face, and it was in a book I read, for, it's called From Good to Great. It's a good book if you ever want to read a book. Um, but it's one of the key messages from that is face the brutal facts. So face the brutal facts of how much you're spending and how much you're making from your magazine category. Um, face the brutal facts on how much you're spending on this part of your store that you don't think is turning over very well and be very clear on it. And then you've got to take some risks. You, got, I mean, informed risks. Um, when we transitioned Lucky Charm Rockingham from traditional news agency with tobacco and the like, um, and the refit cost 200,000, whatever it cost back then, um, my mum was still a partner in the business and not an active partner, but she did the accounts and she was sort of saying, it's a waste of money, you know, you know we're not going to get a return on it. Um, 
but I, th I knew we needed to change. So we changed the store entirely. We did a quite a modern fit out with the store um, um, and spent a fair bit on furniture um, and buffets and display tables. Like display table on the front of that our store, there's $3,000. It's a display table, a big two, yep. point, two meter display table with bench seats and all that sort of stuff. And I sort of got the view that it was a waste of money. Um, but two years later, you know, the store's grown into getting close to 500000 in giftware. Yep. Um, and uh, I do like to remind mum at family dinner, which is Wednesday, every Wednesday night, including tonight, or I might remind her again tonight, um, that it wasn't such a bad idea, was it? To take the risk, um, transition your store and make the change. Just don't keep doing what you've been doing because... Um, not only the traditional news agency channels aren't what they used to be, but even things you're doing now need to change. So face the brutal facts and make the call um, and take some informed risks uh, is what I'd recommend. Fantastic. I think that's a great spot for us to leave it. But thank you again, Scott. It's been uh, terrific and you've really shared some really valuable insights that I think will uh, you know, encourage people that have... Uh, listened in to um to go and think again about different aspects of their businesses and and how to adapt and how to navigate this next six months or so and um yeah really appreciate your um insights and expertise and uh, appreciate the time to come on and chat with uh, the members today all right thanks ben thanks everyone for listening thanks everyone and um we'll uh look forward to hosting you again on our next webinar um in the not too distant future talk soon bye Cheers.